relatedly, I was watching this TV program once and there was a story about a woman and her son in a park and the little boy was pointing to a boulder and he said to his mum, I want to be able to lift that. And she said, if you lift with all of your strength, you will be able to do it. So he goes over, he tries to pick it up, he can't move it. And he says to his mum, mum, you said if I lifted with all of my strength, I'd be able to do this. And she says, wait a second. She gets up, she goes over to the boulder, she takes the other side and they lift it together. And she says to him, now you are lifting with all of your strength. For people like us, it might not be our mothers that can lift with us, but you have to find those people that will help you with those really difficult things in your life. So I guess that my advice in summary is just because something feels too heavy to lift now doesn't mean that it always will be. And second, you should never have to lift alone. This is Mike Balaban for Bammer and Me with another podcast interview. My guest today is Mohsen Zaidi, lawyer, LGBTQ activist, and author of the Penguin Press bestseller, A Dutiful Boy, The Memoir. Mohsen, first of all, I forgot to ask you beforehand, in the book, you go by Mose. Do you still use that or are you Mohsen now? No, I mean, I don't mind, but usually Mohsen. Okay. Thanks for agreeing to let me interview. I'm Thank so, you for having me. I'm so glad to have the opportunity to meet. You know, this week has kind of been crazy for me. I developed COVID. I'm now coming out of quarantine. We still managed to salvage this thing. We did. You know, I've read and was incredibly moved by your memoir, uh, A Dutiful Boy, uh, Son. And, dutiful Boy. Sorry, Dutiful Boy. Oh, yeah, yeah. You got it right the first time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's been advertised as a book that will save lives. And I have to admit that I was brought to tears numerous times. As I know how much we have to cover in a short period of time, we're going to get right into it. Sure. You beautifully convey the cultural alienation you ineluctably experienced growing up both Muslim and secretly gay in London in the 90s. Can you describe some of the strict demands of Shia Islam that made growing up in a secular society like the UK so difficult? Well, I suppose the first thing to say is that when we talk about faith, it's very easy for people who don't understand or don't come from that background to assume that religious rules or religiosity is somehow the same as an absence of love or for things to be cold or when you grow up in an environment where there are strict rules around what you can and cannot do. Like, for example, we don't drink. Um, we have to be thoughtful about the clothes that we wear, the food that we eat, the times that we pray, the ways that we pray, um, the way that we interact with the world spiritually. There are lots of ways in which those rules have an impact on the lives that we lead. But I do think it's important to start answering your question by emphasizing that religion can be a source of great love and it can be a source of great hope and particularly in circumstances where you don't have very much else faith is the thing that people hold on to and it's certainly what i held on to so yes there were lots of uh, strict rules around what i could and couldn't eat or drink and the ways in which i was supposed to behave but i would say that they for the most part were a guiding welcomed force that I needed to anchor me in a situation where we had very little. Well, particularly in today's world where so few people have a sense of rootedness and belonging. Mm, absolutely. And, you know, my family were Pakistani immigrants and we lived in a very poor part of London. Um, and as I write, we didn't feel as though the riches of London were available to us because they weren't. And one of the things that the book is about is also about class because I grew up in public housing. And if anything, that for me is the most important aspect of the book is the journey that one takes as an interloper between different worlds. One of those journeys being a world from being desperately poor to 
being relatively well off and what that can feel like and how complicated that can be. Well, I'll get to it mm. later, but it's, you know, I'm going to want to ask how you made that journey because so many people are not able to yep. do that. What was it like for you and your family growing up in London under those conditions? You know, it's interesting because when you're, when you're writing something like a memoir, you have to be careful to write from the perspective of that seven-year-old boy and not the 30-something-year-old that is writing upon reflection. And I think that the same is true when I answer these questions. So in answer to your question, what was it like to grow up at that time? It was joyful. The mosque was the center of our lives. We had family around us. Uh, on Eid, because we lived in a predominantly Pakistani neighborhood, people were knocking on each other's doors and bringing food to each other's houses. And it didn't matter that we didn't have very much because we didn't really appreciate it, I would say, the extent to which we were poor, or at least I didn't. But it didn't, it didn't actually have a bearing on the experiences of being in that environment. Now, don't get me wrong. It was a place that had some serious crime issues, uh, but feeling unsafe when you left the house was not abnormal for me. And so I almost felt safe anyway, if that makes sense. Uh, the danger that comes from being in a, in a neighborhood where there is crime was a ordinary part of walking down the street. And so growing up at that time, it felt wonderfully communal in a way that I no longer feel. And I think that that is one of the things that I do miss about growing up at that time in that neighborhood, in that culture. I felt such a sense of rootedness and a sense that there were a group of people, blood relatives and otherwise, who I could turn to. And I'm not sure that modern day living in places like New York and London really accommodates that you have to wonder even in a very religious let's say pakistani family in london in an equivalent neighborhood are they successfully able to recreate that sense of security absolutely and it's something that i think about a lot at the moment as i talk as i think about children myself because i'd want them to grow up with the same sense of community that i had there are definitely parts of my upbringing, some of the rules that aren't necessarily for me, but those rules, that sense of there being a structure that you respect, it isn't all bad. Despite feeling secure and loved and surrounded, mm -hmm. there were things about you, like all of us who grew up LGBTQ, that quickly became apparent to us that were different. And like many LGBTQ youth, your childhood school experiences were marked by incessant bullying. Mm. Why did they pick on you and how did you deal with those experiences? They picked on me because I was vulnerable. I sounded like this. And for those that are not British, uh, People who come from my part of London do not sound like me. They have a an different type of accent. Um, and I sounded much more, what's the word? Refined? <laughs> Refined, I mean, I don't <laughs> want to put it that way. I, I sounded much more middle class. And so that was one reason. The other reason was that I really wanted to work hard at school. I was timid. I wasn't very confident. Well, you wanted that as much for your parents and for the, the grades and the recognition mm. so that you would please them, right? Yeah, absolutely. And when I reflect on it now, I mean, for a, for a long time, I was very angry and upset about the way that I was treated at school. But when I reflect on the fact that all of those kids were in some way lost or wanting for something, because we all were, because... We, although we lived in one of the richest cities in the world, we were almost invisible. And when people feel invisible, they act up. And so I, I don't, I don't hold any uh, resentment towards those people anymore. 
but I think that one of the reasons I was bullied was because I was an easy target. You know, I, I have friends in the U.S. who maybe grew up in lower-class neighborhoods with peers who spoke differently. And they, too, found a way to learn good English and to be out of place. Mm. What do you think it is that spurs a young five, six, seven, eight-year-old boy to find that way? Yeah. Um, in my circumstance, and I write about this, what actually happened was that my mum came to the UK when she was six years old, and she moved to a part of the UK, just outside of London, where everybody sounded the way that I do. And so my mum has this accent, and I'm the oldest child, so I ended up learning English predominantly from her. Whereas my brothers, if you, if you speak to them, they sound very different from me and my mum. They sound way more East London than I did. So that's, that's my reason. But I think you're right. I th you know, there's this whole joke around the gay voice, right? right. And, and I'm sure that plays a part in it too somewhere. Right. I was surprised by the relentless antipathy towards homosexuality embedded in the Islamic religion. Considering that modern historians feel the Prophet Muhammad never explicitly forbade homosexual relations outright, uh, he opposed it, but mm. there was no prohibition in the Quran. How did this ferocious loathing emerge, do you think? And as an example, kind of related, would you explain how and why your brother Abbas planned marriage to his fiance could easily have been de derailed once it became known you were gay? I think the very first thing to say is that it is easy to hone in on religion as being the source of homophobia. There is a long history around why we have arrived at this point. But in my circumstance, I grew up in a 90s Britain where it was illegal to marry the person you love. The AIDS crisis was ongoing and gay men were getting the blame. And the Tory government, the, the conservative government of the day, implemented something called Section 28, was a piece of, piece of legislation, which you'll know this, I'm sure, which prevented the promotion, quote unquote, of homosexuality in schools. Incidentally, it's the same legislation that Vladimir Putin has is using today to criminalize. And we had our own version in, in 1977 in the US going on right, in California. Okay, I, did, I didn't actually know that. So I always like to emphasize that the, the homophobia that I experienced growing up, yes, part of it was to do with my culture and my faith and the absence of understanding there. And we'll come on to that in a moment. But so much of it was to do with the society I grew up in. And the cultural markers around you. Absolutely. You know, when the British colonized India, right. they brought homophobia with them, as they did in so many other parts of the world. To Africa and yeah, plenty of places. Actually, there, are, there is plenty of evidence that um, same-sex love and the transgender community was a kind of accepted part of cultural identity in South Asia. For well, the interesting thing is the attitudes towards homosexuality are mutable over the centuries. There's a book that John Boswell wrote uh, about Christianity, whereby the Catholic Church sanctioned weddings between men in the ca cathedrals. No way. In the 15th century. Wow. Yeah, I can refer it to you later. Oh, yeah, I'd love to read that. Um, but, to, but to turn for a moment then to, to faith and culture, I do think part of it is to do with an absence of stories an absence of the ability to discuss the issue and a fear of what will happen if you do. In the case of culture in particular, when you are an immigrant community and you are transplanted elsewhere, you hold on to the things that you know to be true and you fend off things that feel alien. And I think that part of my parents' reaction to my sexuality was a sense that uh, the ship was filling up with water. You know, the sense that my, their, one of their children was being taken away, was becoming Western. The irony is so many immigrant families want their children to immerse themselves and make the transition because it's Absolutely. so hard for them to be different. Mm. But there's only so far you want them to go. Yeah. And that was one of the conversations that I had with my parents, that they, they, they came here for a better life for their children, but wanted to pick and choose those aspects that the, the child gets to take advantage of. And the other thing about it is that actually there are 
articles and studies that suggest that homophobia has actually diminished in places like Pakistan and that communities in places like England are more likely have, are holding on to their homophobia with more fervor than the countries that they're from because they have taken the attitudes of the 70s and 80s Pakistan that they moved from and whilst Pakistan has evolved and developed I mean I'm not saying entirely but it has moved on in its thinking that has not been so true of communities in in the UK I mean it's a really complicated picture um and and, and I should say that I try to focus on my own experience because I think it's very difficult to speak for a billion people um how about Abbas's marriage yeah it's interesting you ask that question the the reason it was complicated for my brother to get married without telling his prospective Muslim wife about me is that there is a lot of cultural stigma and religious stigma around someone being gay. And by marrying into our family, anybody who marries into our family would have to take, that, take on that stigma. But also, their family would have done. And my brother rightly felt that he had an obligation to tell the person he was going to marry that this was the case. Now, you know, you could say, well, what, you know, isn't that amounting to apologizing for homosexuality or having to, to, be, to treat something that should not be embarrassing in a way that is embarrassing? But that was the fact of our cultural setup. That was the way that things worked. And I, I do understand why he, why he had well, to do that. Well, the alternative would have been to lie and Absolutely. have it come out later and ruin everything. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and it that, was pretty remarkable that he said, if she won't accept it, then I guess I'll have to find another wife. Yeah. Yes. That, that's love and overcoming's uh. cultural stigma of centuries. How much do you think the rigid interpretation of male and female roles and responsibilities in traditional Islam contributes to the alienation and isolation that young Western raised Islamic youth experience, especially those that don't fit in the usual mold? I mean, look, I, I have to pick apart your question a bit there, because if you think about what you said, you said the traditional role it, that Islam feels that men and women should play. But actually, that isn't limited to Islam. Like the, the, the sense of patriarchy that exists across the world. I mean, we're in America where women are being told how they can and cannot use their, their bodies. So it's really important to acknowledge that the insidious sexism that, that exists in the world is not limited to, to one faith or culture. I, I'm only thinking of the really extreme situation, of, for example, where you talked about how you offered to help your mother make some of the food in the kitchen. Yeah. And your father said, no son of mine is going to do that. Yeah. And you thought, wow, I'm lucky I don't have a sister. Yeah. Because she'd have to work in a job and then come home and do all the cooking like my mother does. Absolutely. So there's that yeah. excess. Yeah, and um, look, that, that is not to say that it doesn't exist. But it's interesting because, I mean, I read something recently that said that women, and this is not, not Muslim women, women in relationships where both partners work still end up doing the vast majority of the housework. Raising kids. Exactly. Taking, yeah. Absolutely. So, um, Despite all the best intentions and, exactly. and, and sayings and, of their and spouses. All, and all of the kind of, Exactly. Despite all the best intentions, despite all the dialogue around us all being feminists, who ends up... We let them do it. <laughs> exactly. Who ends up holding the baby? Literally. Right. It's still women. And sending the Christmas cards and calling on birthdays and it's yeah. mothers. And, and I probably sound quite defensive about Islam when I respond to questions in that way. And that's because I am. I think it's very easy for people to take what I have written and use it to say, well, look, look at the ways in which Islam is oppressive or treats people poorly if they are gay or women. And for me, that is not the case. For me, that the, the, there is a lot of beauty and there is a lot of love in my faith and in my culture. But there is also a lot of other stuff and there's also a lot of complexity and stuff that is not ideal. And I think that we should be able to celebrate the good and try and improve the bad. I certainly don't mean to let other religions off the hook. No, 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 I know. But we're talking <laughs> about Islam. I, I just think what I have always been mindful of when writing about something as complicated as sexuality and faith is not for there to be any villains, because I do not believe in the, the idea that things are as simple as 
that person is bad and this person is good or that religion is bad and this... this well, there's nothing worse than black and white, absolutely, period. Absolutely. Yeah. And to illustrate the point, when I was publishing the book, I must confess that this is my own Islamophobia coming out. I expected to receive hor horrible messages from Muslims. I expected, it, to the extent anyone read it, I expected Muslims who read it to be really d discouraging. And the vast majority of the messages I have received from the Muslim community have been loving and kind. That's great. Yeah. You know, family and religious expectations were critical in shaping your character. One was the idea that your family was sacrificing everything so that you could become a success. Mm -hmm. And once you did, you'd leverage that success to lift up the other members. Yeah. How was that expectation a spur and an impediment? in your own development? And how did you balance those expectations with the even more entrenched one that you'd embrace a traditional Islamic family life? The spur was to try and get us out. It was to try and find a way. The way I describe it is poverty is some, something like this really deep ditch. And the more that you clamber to try and get out of the ditch, the more mud that seems to fall and the further in you get because of the societal structures that basically allow rich people to stay rich and poor people to stay poor. And I felt the same. And so I just felt like I had to clamber and clamber and clamber as hard as I could to get out of the ditch and then start building. And, you know, when we, when we talk about class, we, we forget that, you know, when you are born into the middle class or more, you are not even starting from the ground and building up. You're starting from a skyscraper and then you're building more. Whereas for, for poor people, you're not starting at the ground and building up. You're starting in that ditch. We have a, a saying that, you know, in baseball, do you know what a home run is? Yes. They say that somebody thinks they hit a home run, but they started on third base. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, also, incidentally, I don't think there's a problem with saying so. I, and I don't think that there is a problem with people acknowledging that. You can still be really successful, really creative, really good at what you do and acknowledge that you started at third and base. And own your privilege. Absolutely. And do something with it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, do you think, this is a hard question to answer and we don't have time to go into depth. Do you think the class structures in the UK are appreciably different or not than in the US? I, to me, it feels like there's more opportunity for people to climb out here, yeah. but there are just as many entrenched barriers that they face to do so. It's interesting. I think that Americans are better at talking about race and British people are better at talking about class but neither is very good at doing anything about it. <laughs> I would say, I would hazard a guess, and I'd have to check the numbers, and because of the lawyer in me, I like to do that, but I won't right now. I think, I would imagine that the gap between rich and poor in America is even greater than that in Britain. I this think, is only in the last 40 years, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's partly to do with the immense wealth in, right. in the US. I would imagine that actually, the economic obstacles to succeed in America if you are poor, are probably actually greater. But the societal and structural obstacles to succeed if you are poor in Britain are greater. What I mean by that is um, the class structures are more entrenched in Britain. We are so tiny, but as soon as somebody opens their mouth, other than me, you know, you can, you know exactly where they are on the class spectrum when they tell you what school they went to, when they tell you what university they went to, when they tell you what supermarket they shop at. All of those things will help somebody to place someone on this pyramid that we've invented. And then try to keep them in that box. Yes. And it's not even, I don't think it's entirely, not intentional on the part of the individual. I think that it is intentional part of the, the system and the structure that is created to keep poor people down. Uh, well, I should say it's, it's, it's created to keep rich people rich. You know, I don't think it's intended... Uh, I think poor people are the byproduct. But yeah, so I, do, I, I think that America and Britain have different challenges and different problems when it comes to class and how they address them would, I, I guess, also have to be approached differently. It's a complicated topic. Absolutely, yeah. Um, you spent years fervently praying to Allah and doing everything you could to deny and erase your same-sex attractions like m most of us. Yeah. You know, we experienced the same challenge, but most of us were from more forgiving religious cultures. Mm. Uh, what were some of the efforts you made to accommodate the tenets of Islam? And you, you talk about them ad infinitum in your book, yeah. but just can you give uh, the audience a couple of examples? 
So interestingly, the working title of the book for quite a while was 11,000 Prayers. And that's because I calculated that between around the age of 13 and the age of 20, no, 19, maybe 11 and 19, when I was in my teenage years, I was praying five times a day. And every day and every, every time I prayed, I just prayed for the same thing, which is not to be gay. And I calculated that was about 11,000 prayers. So prayer was a really important part of keeping me on track. And actually, I miss it now. You know, we talk about transcendental meditation or even just meditation for five minutes to take time out of your day to be restorative. And I think that more than anything, that is what prayer is about. I don't think it's just about ticking a box. I think it is about finding moments in your day for peace. And I, I miss that. So prayer was one. The other was building a really strong relationship with my mosque. So I would go, not just every Friday, but regularly, and I would help to paint walls or give out food or to set up events. And all of it was in service of not just my faith, but also of my community. But it was also an attempt to hold on to my religion and to ignore my sexuality. As an openly gay man in a large metropolitan area, can one find any sort of substitute for that? And have you? I think the answer is no. Yeah. I, I wish it weren't. Yeah. I, I do think so. I, I remember when I was uh, a late teenager, whenever I would go abroad, we'd find local mosques and people would welcome us and we'd eat with them and uh, we'd pray with them. And then when I came out and I was in my mid-twenties, when I would go abroad, I'd go to gay bars. And yeah, okay, part of that was about meeting boys. But it was also about community. And I would make friends and I would be invited to their homes and we would eat dinner together and we would bond over our coming out experiences and how hard our parents were finding it. And, and that comparison... I think there is such beauty in, because actually, when I left one community, I was able to find another. Now, the problem is that there, as with every community, there, they, there is no such thing as one voice or uh, no homogenous way of looking at things. And so I think that I was probably too idealistic about the sense of community I was getting from the LGBT space. I and actually, actually have an example. Oh, yeah. And that's the AA, oh. the gay AA groups. Oh. When friends of mine who belong to those organizations travel to any city, they can immediately go to a meeting and be welcomed with open arms and feel part of something. Wow. You know, but of course, you have to have gone through that whole painful process and have that need. I wish there was something like that for those of us who didn't go through that. Yeah. It's interesting because we, well, I say we, I think people that no longer practice faith or don't, didn't in the first place, can sometimes be quick to dismiss it. And actually, for me, my faith wasn't about God. It was about feeling less alone. And I think it would be wonderful to create that. I do think that the LGBT community has the opportunity to do it, and I do think there are pockets of it. But the, it is complicated by the fact that we also like hooking up with each other and and, that and can it's make complicated things... by the fact that we are lgbtqia yeah. plus and not everybody feels like they're part of everybody else yeah yeah um i would love to find a way of creating that space for lgbt people if Quiet. either of us comes up with any ideas absolutely let's make sure we connect that's a deal <laughs> coming from the public education system as you did you never dreamed you might be accepted into, into Oxbridge, which for Americans, as I understand, is the hybrid for Oxford and Cambridge. Isn't yes. It? Though your parents always did, or at least from the way they talked yeah. about Oxford in your book. Yeah, yeah. I mean, always is probably an overstatement. What happened was I, in my penultimate year of high school, I got top grades. And it was then that my parents said, okay, well, you've got the grades to apply to Oxford. And my view was that would be a wasted application because you, you you're limited to six or I think it's five now, but when I was applying it was six. My, so my parents felt that I should apply. I thought it was a wasted slot. And ultimately, they were the ones who encouraged me to do it. And I'm really glad they did. It seems like England's educational system is pretty sclerotic okay. in terms of 
entrenched in certain, you know, if you enter that lower form public school, you're probably stuck there. And yet you managed to make an ascent through that system, no doubt by dint of application and ability. What do you think that was that got you to the point where you would end up at Oxford? When people write memoirs, it's easy to assume that they are the hero of the story. And it's really important for me in the telling of this story and in the answering of this question to emphasize that there were people entirely along my path that helped get me to this point. And that includes getting into pl a place like Oxford. I had teachers that would stay behind late and talk to me directly because the class was too riotous during the, the, the lesson to be able to give me the attention I needed. My parents would make me sit down and do my homework and more than in order to make sure that I was getting the support that I needed. I couldn't have done that without the guidance of other people. My English teacher, Ms. Lupton, I remember when I was applying to this fancy school for my final two years of high school, she helped me write my application form. I remember we were sat there and as she was helping me with my statement, she paused and she looked at me and she said, I think that this place will be really good for you. And I really didn't understand what she meant. I kind of thought, oh, she's just like my parents making me, you know, do this thing that I don't want to do, go to the school that I don't want to go to. But actually there was so much emotion in what she was saying. What she was saying was, you have a chance to succeed and this place will give you that chance. And I, I, and I kind of wish I could find her to say thank you. Perhaps you can. Yeah. Social media. Yeah, I'm, I should have a look. Basically, you had angels and you worked hard. Yeah, I've been very lucky. It was a long and slow process, and the book details that. Uh, for your devout family to adjust the fact that you were openly gay and to deal with the impact of that among their community. Mm -hmm. Can you explain what enabled them to make that journey, perhaps painfully at times, and reach the point of accepting you and loving you for who you are? And do you think that's something that is clearly not universally possible, but do you think it is perhaps more broadly possible if handled right over a long period of time? To answer your second question first, I, I think it's very difficult to generalize about what is and isn't possible for people. And I always hesitate to do so because everybody is different and every family is different. My sincere hope is that by talking about these issues, and telling these stories, we come closer to that reality, that more parents and more families can be accepting of their children for who they are. In my case, the way I put it is that my parents instilled in each of me and my two brothers a superpower. And that superpower was the ability to love. And what I did was I used that superpower against them. And every moment, that they hated my sexuality and every moment that they wanted me to leave the country or go leave the room or go away or hide the parts of myself including the parts that they didn't like every moment that they slapped me away i held on but the reason that i held on that the, the the fuel was that superpower was that love and so i think that although it did take many years, ultimately, I was using what they had taught me against them. Wow. That's powerful. Your professional path has involved you moving through several different careers. First, as a solicitor, because you felt the need to lift your family up with the economic and financial benefits that that provides. Mm. Then as a barrister, because that was more true to your passion. Now I, you're a consultant. And so I'm kind of curious if you can just tell us briefly about that path and your motivations. The law is all about justice and fairness. And I have an innate sense of what I believe to be just and fair. And so I think that it was always a natural path that I would become a lawyer. And for 13 years, I loved being a lawyer. And sometimes I, I do miss it. 
as you say, I started off life at a big corporate law firm because I was going to be paid more than my parents combined. And there was no way I could say no to that. But my passion was to work in the criminal law for lots of reasons, not least because as a kid, that's what, when you think about a lawyer, you imagine that, you imagine the litigation in court. Well, that's closer to justice and fairness than corporate law. Well, I, I don't know about that, actually. I mean, I think it, it, it's closer to what we believe is just and fair. Actually, corporate lawyers are having to uphold the rule of law as well in their own way, but it was just not the way that I wanted to do it. I like storytelling. I like people. I wanted to learn more about people and I wanted to work with people. So part of becoming a barrister was about that. Uh, and part of it was releasing myself somewhat from the expectations of somebody who was poor, but who no longer is. And what I mean by that is that as a corporate lawyer, I earn a lot of money. And, I, and if I'd stayed there, I'd, be on a, I'd have a lot more money today. But there was a moment when I realized that that was the only reason I was there. And for me, that wasn't a good enough reason. But I loved the law because I believe so much of what lawyers do and, and the role they play in society to be extremely important. I know they get a, 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 a hard time. And so the criminal law felt like a natural calling. And for six years, I loved being criminal lawyer. Ultimately, the reason that I have moved away from it, at least for now, is because what I do here at Hacklet is very interesting. It allows me to learn a lot more about the world outside of the law. And that was an important part of my kind of evolution as a professional. It was trying to figure out how I can be something other than the one thing I have done for the last 13 years. And as wonderful and amazing as the law is, I've, I've always felt like there's a certain straitjacket to the Socratic method, at least in this country. Mm. It makes you look at every problem through that lens. Absolutely. And not be able to be creative about other possible ways to solve it. Yeah, and I think the best lawyers are able to do that. The way that I put it is, if I could lead nine lives, one of mine would be as a criminal barrister, definitely, because I'm sure that I would have a wonderful life and I would enjoy it very much. But because I only get to lead one, I have to see what else is out there. You've had numerous awards and honors, both in the legal profession and as an LGBTQ activist. The Financial Times, I believe, listed you as one of the top 20 future LGBTQ leaders in the UK. How do you manage to balance your professional and your activist responsibilities? I think to suggest balance is to suggest that they are somehow different. I mean, I suppose they are different, but I, I try to lead one life and focus on the things I care about. Professionally, they, yeah, professionally, sometimes they're different to the things that are personal. But I think at the core of everything that I do is a sense of a value system of, of the things that I care about and the person I'd like to be and the world I'd like to live in. On a, on a kind of more practical, practical basis, it's a question of time management, which I'm, I try to be quite good at. It does mean that I probably work most weekends, most evenings. Actually, that's not quite true. I try to have some downtime as well. But the things I'm doing, both personally and professionally, I'm doing because I, I love and care about them. And I think the most important thing is being discerning about the things that you're doing for the right reasons and the wrong reasons. And I think that, as I said a moment ago, I realized that I was a corporate lawyer because of the money and that that wasn't a good enough reason. In your memoir, you discuss the challenges of being South Asian in the gay male community, where conscious and unconscious racism is fairly widespread. I mean, it, mm -hmm. it's widespread everywhere, not just there. Yeah. Uh, how do you deal with that feeling of being different, even within a community of other outsiders. How do you, uh, <laughs> Sometimes not very well is the answer. There are, there are times when you are rendered invisible in those spaces. And there are times when you're rendered hyper visible in those spaces. And both can be dehumanizing and uncomfortable. My reaction when I was first out was to aspire to whiteness, was to only run after white men and to dumb down 
as much as possible my difference. Don't think. you think society kind of impels people in that position? It does almost to do that. Yeah, it does, and but I think that's magnified in the um, in the gay in the gay male community in particular. I think that there are forces that create such a strong sense of what it means to be gay and what it doesn't and what it means to be attractive in the gay community and what it doesn't so one so as of when i was younger I, I my my solution was to aspire to whiteness and as you can probably see that didn't go very well the, but then when i got older i sought out spaces where there were other lgbt people who were people of color and there is a wonder and a fullness of life that I feel in those spaces that I don't really feel anywhere else. And the more time I spent in those spaces and the more time I spent around black and brown people, handsome and beautiful black and brown people, the more I was able to look in a mirror and feel that same beauty for myself. And so ultimately, I had to escape the white male, the gay white male gaze. Gay, uh, gaze is in sight, not just the uh, gaze is in gaze, but I had to escape that in order to rid myself of it. I was, uh, I got taken to task for the monochromatic nature of some of my photos from the past, when in fact we were not thrown together with people of different color. But it made me look at today and the photos I take, and it made me take the invitation of a black friend and go to an all black LGBTQ cultural affairs weekend where I was one of two whites and 322 people. But it's a it's an experience to put oneself in the shoes of a minority, yeah. of a different minority. We're already yeah. in one mm. for the very first time. And and what I learned above all else is that people in that community look at color before they look at sexual orientation because color is immutable. Yeah. You can't hide it. Mm -hmm. Sexual orientation, you can. I think that's one reason, actually. I, I think there are others as well. Yeah. I, some of them are economic, right. generally mm -hmm. speaking people of color are, are disproportionately more likely to be poor. Um, your economic experience has a direct impact on who you are and, right. and the life that you lead and the values that you have and the way that you look at the world. So what you end up with is a community of people of color in the, LG, in the LGBT space who are different in not just their the, the, the skin tones, but in their life experiences. They can't afford to go to Provincetown. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being I mean, facetious, but I'm not. Well, yeah, I mean, I, th I, I, I think... There is more to it than that in the sense of, as somebody who is a person of color, you are othered in a white majority society in plenty of ways. People of color have been told for centuries that they are not good enough, they are not attractive enough, they are not intelligent enough. They don't meet what the white standards. White standards of beauty are hyper-sexualized in, in the gay space. I'm going to speak specifically about gay men here. And so it's very easy to look at those spaces and to feel inferior, even if nobody in those spaces feels that way about you. Right, right. I feel a sense of safety in queer spaces, in queer spaces of color, and a sense, in fact, the best way to put it is that I don't feel anything in those spaces. I'm, I'm not feeling insecure. I'm not worried about what I'm wearing. I'm not worried about my skin tone. I'm not worried about the job that I do or the way that I speak. Exactly. What I am doing is just being. If anything, I mean, I've, I'm, I'm excited because I've just hit upon this, right? But if anything, it's an absence of emotion because you just get to exist in that space. But that's amazing because it's so few places where you don't have these inputs. Absolutely. So when I talked about the wonder, what I actually was probably feeling was free. In your book, you talk about when you first began to date and accept yourself. And was your boyfriend? Matthew. Matthew. And I just found out today, not knowing that, in fact, you and Matthew got married. We did. So tell us a little bit about your life and how you got here. We met in a gay bar in, in London called The Two Brewers, which is nicknamed The Two Sewers because of how terrible people say it is, although I think it's a fantastic place to go out. And seven and a half years later, we are now married. We were supposed to get married in Ireland on the 4th of April, 2020, and then COVID scuppered that. But we did get married last year, and then we moved to New York uh, also last year, where we are enjoying our lives. It's been, what is Matthew doing here? Uh, he's the creative director of a brand called Roadbook, which is a travel, online travel brand. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, he's a graphic designer by training. 
Final question. Do you have any advice for others facing the same journey you did of self-acceptance and of being accepted as queer by their conservative religious families? I mean, we've yeah. touched on it. But... Yeah. So I, I get asked this, and I, and I have an answer that means something to me, and so I give it whenever I'm asked it. I go to the gym and I try and lift weights. I'm not very good at it, as you can see, but I do try. And it does make me feel better, which is the main thing. And I, I go in and, and one of my trainers is a guy called Alex. And he used to say, lift that. And he'd point at this bar with some heavy weights on it. And I'd be like, no, 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 I can't, I can't. And he would say, Mosin, you can't yet. And I think that the same thing is true of our identities, of things that can feel too heavy to lift. But that doesn't mean that they always will be. When I was a, an 18, 19 year old having to deal with class and race and sexuality and faith, all of those issues were too heavy for me to lift. But as I built my strength, I would and was able one day to lift them. Relatedly, I was watching this TV program once and there was a story about a woman and her son in a park and the little boy was pointing to a boulder and he said to his mum, I want to be able to lift that. And she said, if you lift with all of your strength, you will be able to do it. So he goes over, he tries to pick it up, he can't move it. And he says to his mum, mum, you said if I lifted with all of my strength, I'd be able to do this. And she says, wait a second. She gets up, she goes over to the boulder, she takes the other side and they lift it together. And she says to him, now you are lifting with all of your strength. For people like us, it might not be our mothers that can lift with us. But you have to find those people that will help you with those really difficult things in your life. So I guess that my advice in summary is just because something feels too heavy to lift now doesn't mean that it always will be. And second, you should never have to lift alone. So the first thing is to believe that it will be possible. Yes. And the second is to find allies and tools that will enable you to. Yes. So you don't remain stuck wherever you are. Yeah. This has been wonderful. I appreciate you taking the time out of a crazy career. <laughs> Thank you for having me. My pleasure. I, if you don't mind, I know how busy you are, but I might on the side. I'm, I'm writing a memoir. Yeah. And I'm having a hard time putting myself into the seven-year-old me. Oh, okay. And not writing into the voice of today. Yeah, so that's challenging. Some advice at some point. Very happy to. This has been wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank again. you for having me. My pleasure. The podcast you've been listening to is produced by Mike Balaban and Tom Walker, recorded and researched by Mike Balaban, with editing and music from Henry Leigh.